Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. We have a great webinar on tap, as always, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the event, you will be able to access it later on. After today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's presentation you have a question, please don't wait, don't hesitate, just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your questions. And we'll get to as many as we can near the end of today's webinar. Okay, with that, we will go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is making me very hungry, even as we start here. Do not let, or donut, let vulnerabilities create a hole in your organization. Our speaker today is Javier Perez, who is Director of Product Management SCA at Faircode. So welcome, Javier. Thank you for joining me today. Thanks, Charlene. Good to be here. Great. Well, I know you've got a great presentation, so I'm going to put myself on mute and let you get right to it. Excellent, thanks. Um, again, good morning, good, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, really great to, to be here and, and talk about uh, open source, talk about uh, security. Um, as Sherlyn mentioned, I run product management um, uh, at Veracode, uh, specifically on the software composition analysis product. So what we're gonna do today, I wanna talk to you about um, the status of open source uh, with regards to security, uh, the challenges on um, to secure those open source components and libraries that are, are so popular or that, are, that keep growing and they are everywhere, right? Wherever there's an application, uh, there's very good chance that there's a good part of that application already using open source components, open source libraries. So I'm gonna talk about that and then not only just the challenges, but some some of the solutions, some of the uh, how to go and, and address those those challenges around open source security. Um, not going to talk about it specifically about a, a software composition analysis product, but I'll I'll talk some of the features and some of the the, the, the important functionality that uh, you might want to uh, uh, explore on on a, on a SEA software composition analysis product. Uh, in this case from, from Veracode. So without uh, further ado, I'm, I'm gonna move up to the, the next slide and talk to you about uh, the explosive growth of open source, right? I mean, these numbers are uh, unbelievable. And, and by the way, these are just from GitHub. The, these are recent numbers from August, 2019. And, and it's just GitHub, right? That's not the only place where there's open source uh, software out there. There, there, there are other uh, public repositories, but you know, using GitHub as a reference, being the, the largest uh, place or repository or space for, for open source. Uh, just look at these numbers, right? Over a hundred million repositories, meaning over a hundred million places where you uh, keep or you store your, uh, your code, your, your applications. Uh, more than 40 million developers uh, and growing, by the way, all these numbers keep, keep growing and over 2 million organizations. Uh, that means also this other trend where organizations uh, are embracing open source and they are opening uh, uh, their code. They're showing or they're developing either developing on the open or just sharing you know, scripts and tools and, and the, all these different things that they're doing, right? So we see organizations like uh, Tesla or uh, Netflix that they are sharing uh, if not all, a lot of what they do in their, by, by their software teams, right? And, and they have, have contributed with uh, some great innovations around, uh, you know, uh, containers and around uh, uh, applications using microservices and um, uh, yeah, different technologies around microservices and different scripting, uh, scripting and, and tooling that, that they use. So um, I'm a big fan of uh, open source. Uh, I'm promoting it also internally in my organization to open source more components and open source more scripting. And, and by the way, that also has a benefit for organizations, right? When your customers start using also your, um, 
your tools, well, that, that then your solutions become more uh, sticky, right? The stickiness of, you know, I'm not gonna go and replace you with some other software since I have all these other uh, effort invested on that. I'm using all these integrations and all these different tools uh, around the, the the products that you're offering me. So, um, you know, great space of growth. Uh, very much everyone or most uh, organizations are, are are moving or are offering are moving into open source. Developers keep uh, not only innovating there but also contributing and you know uh, fixing bugs and addressing security items that that I'll talk about in. In, in a few minutes. Um, the other interesting number there is the, and this is just from all last year, 2019, uh, that uh, the number of GitHub repositories grew 40%, right? So we're almost getting to the end of 2019. I'm very sure that it's gonna be uh, more than 40%. So we continue to see that explosion of uh, growth in open source, uh, it's everywhere. And look at these numbers. Uh, these are from uh, the different programming languages that the main repositories for the, the different programming languages. So for AIM and PM, basically Node.js, JavaScript, Node.js, uh, there are more than a million of their basically free uh, available uh, libraries and components uh, right there. But for me, the most impressive uh, number is, is that, that, that it, it's 103 uh, or over a hundred new uh, open source software, or at least public software available there per day. That, that's amazing, right? And, and you can see also the numbers from for Java with maybe Central or PHP or Python or for uh, .NET uh, or for Ruby. Uh, actually, I had this slide, uh, I think I put it together about three months ago and I just last week I went and updated the numbers. Uh, this, this, this information comes from uh, modelcounts.com and, and, uh, and then uh, uh, everything grew, right? <laughs> I think the only one that stayed kind of flat was the Ruby James. Um, um, but everything else, especially the NPM and Nugget kept, you know, the numbers grew uh, uh, at a really impressive rate, right? Uh, in the case of um, .NET, um, as you know, Microsoft has started kind of embracing all open source the last uh, four years. And obviously that has contributed to you know, more people uh, developing on the open, sharing their uh, um, their, their software on, on, on Nugget, right? On all this top, uh, that net technology, especially um, C Sharp. Um, so very impressive numbers. I mean, there, there's no question that open source is, is here to stay and it's gonna continue to, to grow. And, and you see some of the most popular uh, uh, open source software out there. And you, you'll recognize these this, uh, names or these uh, logos, um, but there are many, 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 many more, right? Thousands, thousands, thousands. So um, it's very likely that you're using some of this. If not, you are gonna be using it in the near future, right? If, uh, if you are moving into uh, containers, if you're moving into orchestrating those containers, if you are moving into the latest, you know, um, IDEs like Visual Studio Code, or if you are um, working on machine learning now, most likely you're using TensorFlow or maybe the, a couple of other frameworks, but TensorFlow seems to be the, the leader, uh, which by the way, it's all PHP. No, I'm sorry, uh, Python. It's all Python on TensorFlow. Um, so it's likely that if you're doing um, machine learning or you're about to start with machine learning, you're gonna be using another open source framework, in this case, TensorFlow. And, and just to finalize this, uh, finish this uh, kind of introduction into where we are with open source, uh, it's very clear that not only organizations kind of contributing to open source, but it, all the new technologies are being developed on the open, right? So if your organizations or your personal projects are, uh, uh, you're looking to do some of these things like augmented reality or virtual reality, uh, you can find a lot of that uh, on the open, right? Um, I, I ask when I, when I present this, I, I ask the question of, you know, would you be today, would you be a passenger on an autonomous car, on a self-driving car? Would you, would you sit there and be a passenger on a self-driving car? Uh, some people say no, some people say, oh, sure, we'll do it. Um, the right answer is only if it's safe, right? 
only if it's a if it has secure software, which by the way, it's all software there, right? That it's driving the, the car, only if it's secure, only if it's safe. So um, just moving on into to the businesses, right? And I, I, I kind of mentioned a couple of things here already, but um, you know, businesses are adopting open source and they are contributing to open source. Uh, no question that it's obviously easier to start small and with something free before paying commercial licenses. Um, it's clear that uh, you don't have to start from scratch or you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, there's something out there already on the open that you might use, right? Um, I, I like to give a couple of examples. So one is, you know, if you're building an app that requires login, right? So you, you have to log into the app. Um, you know, I'm sure there are thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of um, of software that already does that, right? So you don't have to go and start from scratch. Um, now, moving more into security, if your application needs encryption, if your application needs to transfer data and has to be encrypted, same thing, right? There are probably thousands of libraries out there that you can reuse to do that encryption and you don't have to uh, get into complicated algorithms and, and start from scratch. So, I mean, these are just kind of some basic, two basic examples, but it's it's true, right? And it happens every day. Uh, developers take all their software and, and they build uh, as, they're, as they're, they need, right? Based on their requirements. Uh, the other nice thing about having so many people contributing is that there are so many also sources of uh, help, source, sources of documentation. You know, from forums and portals to, to videos and, and blog posts. Um, so if you are, uh, companies are buying from a commercial uh, commercial product, uh, commercial software, you know, they, they obviously expect uh, uh, documentation online or, or uh, uh, you know, printed documentation. They expect some uh, level of support, right? Where they have somewhere to call or contact or help. Uh, but when you're working on open source, you might think, well, I don't get any of that. That's why I'm paying. Well, especially in the popular, with the popular um, open source software, you get a lot more, right? There's a lot more sample code. There's a lot more uh, blog posts, videos, recordings, uh, sample apps using. So especially using some of the popular uh, open source software, you get a lot more uh, out there. Um, and, and of course, the, the developers, uh, all developers want, uh, like to learn and like, and like to work on, on new technologies. So it's also a, a, an attractive part of the, uh, the, the part of the retention or recruiting developers. It's important also to keep up with the latest technologies, right? Uh, and, 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 you know, hiring, uh, promoting the, the full stack, right? Having developers that know about different things, about different open source frameworks, about different um, storage technologies, different database technologies, different networking technologies. Um, so definitely also becomes part of the, the organization, part of uh, continue kind of promoting that within your organizations, but at the same time kind of help you with retaining and, and recruiting uh, new talent. So now let's, let's, let's move uh, uh, now into the, the security side of things. Um, Within open source, uh, you have um, uh, vulnerabilities, right? Uh, if those vulnerabilities are uh, documented and published, um, they are known as the common vulnerabilities and exposures, uh, CVEs. Uh, those CVEs have different severities. So there's a scoring system, uh, the common vulnerability score system, CVSS, that uh, kind of measures the scores that uh, vulnerability. So which basically goes from, from 10 to zero, the zero to 10, 10 be, being the, the most critical or the highest priority vulnerability. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so so you, you have your CVEs, you, you publish um, vulnerabilities. Each vulnerability is assigned with a score in terms of the severity, uh, but they're also, a lot of vulnerabilities, I would say more than, than what we have uh, officially published on the National Vulnerability Database, on the NVD, National Vulnerability Database. There's a lot more that it's out there, outside there, right? So there's vulnerabilities in software. They don't have a, an official CVE, 
but there's still vulnerabilities, right? Just because no one really published them or no one you know, had the time to, to go through the, the publishing process or just because, yeah, I mean, no time, basically keep moving, providing a fix. Uh, that, that, that means that there are a lot of vulnerabilities out there. They might not have an official CVSS number, uh, score no, uh, severity score, uh, but there's still many vulnerabilities out there. So let's talk about uh, around security. Let's talk about uh, the, the four major challenges that we've seen uh, over the last few years, um, since I'm working directly with, with uh, uh, open source and security. Um, this comes from like just the experience, um, what we've seen with uh, uh, hundreds of organizations uh, dealing with um, open source software and security on open source. Uh, one one thing that I, I didn't mention earlier is, um, uh, you know, open source means uh, you know it's available, it's out there, but it also means uh, a model, right? It also means that um, many companies can benefit from open source as uh, you know selling the commercial version of the of already open source software uh, or a model where you know uh, companies host uh, the service on the cloud charge for that as a SaaS model. Uh, but still, if you want to do it your own, the software is open source, it's, it's out there. Right? So there, there are different models. Uh, here, uh, I want to focus more on the security side of things um, in, in reference specifically to the software itself. Right. So if we find if there are uh, vulnerabilities in that open source software. So um, I'm, I'm going to go through the, the, these four items uh, just really quick here. Uh, the concept of uh, or the, the, well, what is called silent uh, fixes, meaning uh, it's out there in the open, uh, the vulnerabilities are found, and then there are fixes. Uh, so there's a version of that vulnerability or that library that it's already fixed, um, but nobody knows about it. Right? And that's what we call it silent fixes. Uh, the other item is um, the risk of uh, prioritizing risk. Um, um, some of the components, some of the open source libraries can have, um, you know, hundreds of vulnerabilities. How do I go back and address those, right? How do I prioritize which ones are um, important ones to fix? I mean, I'm not gonna have time to go and fix everything. So that's a challenge with open source. It's not just one or two potential libraries. It could be hundreds of libraries that have hundreds of vulnerabilities. So prioritization is another big challenge. Uh, the next one is uh, the concept of what, what is called transitive vulnerabilities and transitive libraries. Uh, this, this, the challenge here is software uses other software, right? So in this case, open source libraries uses other open source libraries, which are using other open source libraries. And, and, and you see the change, you see the point. So that's another very uh, uh, important uh, situation here, an important challenge that we have in open source. And the fourth point is the, the, the speed of DevOps, right? As organizations, as developers move into uh, automation and these DevOps practices, uh, everything moves much faster. So how do we go and address security items where I just want to go and deploy it and deploy it again and could be you know, in production quickly? Um, so how do I how do I, I I be part of that automation and part of those uh, DevOps DevOps processes? So I'm going to talk about in, in in a little bit more detail on you know how to address these these four challenges in, in open source security. The first one I was mentioning about the silent fixes. Basically, people uh, uh, you know there's already a fix, but nobody knows. Um, uh, first of all, the point of national vulnerability database, right? So um, I always mention this, the, the MVD <clears throat> started many years ago, 25, 30 years ago. Um, it was obviously the very different times. Uh, there were some major players like Microsoft, Oracle, IBM. Uh, there was a, a good guidance, and obviously not as many developers out there. And there was a good guidance of you find a vulnerability, you publish that, right? So you go to uh, the National Vulnerability Database, provide the information, provide also the, the, if there's a fix, uh, what are the versions for the fix. Uh, um, the times have changed, right? We have a lot more developers. We have a lot more programming languages. Uh, we see that uh, some languages like uh, Node.js and Go, um, you know, developers typically, you know, it's less the the, the rate of reporting or publishing um, 
vulnerabilities, meaning getting a CVE for those vulnerabilities. So um, it's it's a challenge, right? Um, the 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 other part is, you know, the National Vulnerability Database has to go and review all of that. So, so there's also a volume issue here. Um, so some, some might be published, but not published within, you know, four weeks or six weeks or even longer than that. Um, so the, the point here is that the, every, it's, op, it's everything on the open, right? So the, the open source software, it's out there for anyone, not just the, not just people are using them, but also for for the bad the bad guys, right? And if they see that there are a vulnerability with a specific on uh, a specific version, and then even if there's already a fix, um, if the enterprises or the apps that those enterprises are using are not on the latest versions, well, the bad guys will take advantage of that, right? Because they have enough information to know about that vulnerability. So, so that's where the, you know, they're also watching um, you know, what's going on on those open source uh, libraries or all those open source components. Um, the next uh, risk with, I, I mentioned about prioritization. So um, the, there's a better way to do it, right? So you may have you know, hundreds or hundreds of uh, vulnerabilities and they say, well, what, what, how do I mean, it's going to take me six months to go on and, and go and fix that or address all of that. Uh, how do I go to the, the high priority ones first? Okay, let's go to the high priority ones first. Uh, and a better way to do it is to see um, what exactly is the part of the, la the library that it's vulnerable, right? That part, that functionality of the library, it's, it's, a it's, called, it's called a method. So what, which one is the vulnerable method? And if I'm using my application, my first party code is using that vulnerable uh, method of the library, of the open source library. So that helps you uh, develop, uh, basically prioritize the work, right? You can start with those uh, and, then, and then you move on to some of the other high priority vulnerabilities that you might not be explorable, explorable at that specific time, but you never know if a new vulnerability is going to come, you know, the next day. Uh, that's the other thing about open source, right? You, especially the popular projects, you have hundreds of contributors, so they they, you, they might introduce uh, or find new vulnerabilities in the existing code. I talk about the transient vulnerabilities uh, briefly. Uh, this, I think, this this chart uh, represents well uh, the fact that. Uh, that the first party code uses different libraries. Well, that's what we call the direct libraries, but then those libraries use other libraries that use other libraries, right? So there's a, there's a change of, um, uh, you know, one uses another, uses another one. And if there's a vulnerability down, it, uh, it affects everything else, right? Uh, explorable vulnerability uh, will affect or most likely affect everything else and including the first party code that is using the library. So uh, that's another, uh, important challenge, and and you you know you you have to to address that. And then I mentioned the develop DevOps speed and automation, which is uh, you know there's a constant development. Uh, people are moving into or developers are moving into also uh, automating their testing, uh, automating the, 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 the how they build the apps. Uh, they have to they have to take the next step to also automate some of the security efforts, right? Uh, if it's not happening uh, because it's just gonna slow down the process, uh, that's that's the main challenge that we have. Uh, so be able to go and, and scan or look for those vulnerabilities uh, in a quick manner in as part of my, as part of the CI pipelines, as part of the continuous integration, um, that has to be the way to go because there's definitely a, a challenge uh, around, uh, you know, the expectation of, delivering often delivering uh, uh, different pieces of functionality. So there's a, there's a challenge there to include security uh, with the speed of uh, uh, automation, speed of DevOps. So how, how, how to secure this OSS, uh, how to secure this OSS, uh, this open source uh, software? Um, 
the, the best way to do it is with a software composition analysis uh, product, uh, which I'm just gonna describe briefly here. It's about scanning the, the, the code um, and identifying um, the open source vulnerability, the open source libraries, and if those open source libraries have a vulnerability. Uh, open, uh, co software composition analysis also includes the detection of open source licenses, uh, which is also important to know that that's, that has a legal and financial aspect as well to, to be, uh, be able to use the proper uh, open source licenses. They're, they're not all open source licenses, this, not all open source licenses are the same. There are restrictions and, and there's some responsibilities. So especially for commercial software, it's important to check on the license status of the different open source components. That, that's one part of it. Um, focusing back on the security side of things on, on vulnerability, um, a software composition analysis will go on, detect the, the open source libraries that are being used, if they have vulnerabilities, and present that in a bill of materials, right? Basically pre present the results of uh, those uh, scans uh, around uh, security and, and licenses. Um, can also detect the different versions, right? And I give you information about, well, you're actually, you know, five or you know, six or seven versions behind the latest version, maybe you wanna try that. Uh, so that, that's another kind of functionality. And, and of course, um, important part of a software composition analysis product is uh, the use of rules or policies. Uh, that's also a great way to prioritize uh, work prioritize, go, uh, go back and address uh, basically the fixes for those vulnerabilities uh, based on policies. And those policies can be defined in many different ways and, and even you know, uh, provide some level of compliance based on the risk tolerance that the organization uh, or the developers defined, right? So just as a quick example, I can say, well, I'm not gonna set any high and, and very high priority uh, vulnerabilities. I need to address all of that before my application goes to production. So that's an example of a policy. Uh, and of course, having function the reporting and kind of analytics uh, capabilities that also helps. So, so you can uh, organize and, and get uh, better information of all that uh, of those applications that you are uh, scanning for uh, for open source libraries and open source vulnerabilities. So here's an example of how to do it, right? Um, how to address that challenge that I was mentioning earlier in terms of, um, you know, not all the vulnerabilities are available out there that are published on the National Vulnerability Database. Um, and the way to do that is to monitor those open source libraries, wherever they are, if they're in GitHub or in other places, and look for, um, you know, those if when they have those vulnerabilities and when if there's a fix. By the way, another nice thing about open source, so not all everything is about risk, but about another really nice thing about open source is the fact that um, developers they contribute back and, and they either address or fix bugs or also address or fix uh, security uh, related items, right? Basically, vulnerabilities. So the idea here is um, a software composition analysis product has to monitor uh, all those libraries, identify the different versions, and as you can see on the example here on the on the graphic, you know, just move from version to version depending on the vulnerabilities that are uh, being addressed or being fixed, uh, and, and have all that information into a database, into an SEA or software composition analysis database. So then you can have as a reference all that information uh, about the vulnerabilities. Here's another example uh, to kind of address that uh, the transitive dependencies or the transitive uh, vulnerabilities issue. Uh, on this chart, uh, the center uh, represents the source code or the, or the first party code. The first ring, the first, um, yeah, the, the first circle or the first ring around the circle represents the direct the, uh, libraries, the direct uh, open source libraries that are used directly. That's basically what you call from your code. And then everything else, it's libraries that are using, are being used by these other libraries, right? So there's a chain, one uses another one, which uses another one, which uses another one. 
And in this example, the very last one, you know, four or five levels later, it's the one with vulnerabilities. So you have to address that. Otherwise, um, there's a risk of uh, explorability that, that you can get exploited. exploited. Um, here's an example of um, kind of like the list of results, the bill of materials, the, the list of uh, defects or, or vulnerabilities with a description, information about the different um, uh, libraries, uh, and then you know different things that you can do about it, right? You could also kind of accept that or, or maybe try to um, mitigate that as, uh, as part of your risk uh, tolerance. Um, but this is just a quick example of you know some of the results. Um, you have to have um, remediation information, right? So uh, a product that gives you the detail of the vulnerability uh, and what versions are safe, and actually even an example of how to fix that, how to address that. Uh, I don't know if you can see if it's not too small, but in this example. Um, you know, it's going from that version 1.5.1 to version 1.12, with that has the fix for, you know, whatever vulnerability was found. Um, so a lot of this is, is to keep up with, keep up with, right? So um, as I was saying, that's a nice thing about open source. The, the people contribute with the fixes. Uh, so those silence fixes is when, you know, there's a fix there, but you need to keep up, otherwise you don't know, right? You don't know whether you have to update to this latest version or this version 1.12 because that's the safe version. So having a tool, a product to help you keep up with that constant change, daily change, or even sometimes hourly change, it's 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 very, very important. Um, it's not like operating system where you just go from one version to another. It's a lot more complicated than that, right? Because we're talking about thousands and thousands of open source libraries. So it's not just one thing. It's 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 the volumes are 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 much 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 larger. Another really good feature, really important to have um, on a uh, software composition analysis product is uh, be able to generate the fix. Right? Uh, we we call it here at Veracore the automatic pull request. So um, as I was mentioning earlier, the fact that um, there are already fixes out there, and the, the key is to know what's the right version, what's the, the version that have provides those fixes. So, so why not take the next step? And why not, not, not only you are able to scan, or able, you are able to identify vulnerabilities and report the, the, the way to fix this, the, the way to fix those or address those vulnerabilities. How about taking the next step, which is basically creating a pull request that developers can use, that they can review, and then they can merge or commit a pull request with the code that is going to address those dependencies, right? So the pull request modifies the package dependency uh, files um, on those direct the dependencies, uh, on those um, the direct uh, open source libraries that are, are used directly to go on and address to the correct version of, uh, of the library. Or the, the one that it's safe or the one that it's actually safer right um, so this this pull request should work on the, the the git repos that developers are using right the likes of github or uh, gitlab or or bitbucket among among others um, some of you might be asking or thinking well okay that sounds sounds good but when when do I do that when do I start looking into this uh, security risk and this into these vulnerabilities? So the, for software composition analysis, the right place to do it is uh, on, on the build and test and release side, what is called the continuous integration side of the, of the development cycle, right? Not, not, not that far to the right when you're just ready to deliver and operate. So it's more on the left side, right? What it's also called shifting left or Moving more towards uh, the left side of the development, software development lifecycle. Um, you can use different ways to, to, to do the scan, like you know, based on an agent, agent-based scanning, or based on, on a platform. So you upload your application and then you get the scan um, via an API or, or via uh, a UI. Um, but that's where it sits, right? Ideally, the closer you are to the developer, 
uh, at development time when they're doing their commits and they're you know do the scans as part of the build the better right because that means that you're going to scan more often that means that you have more time to go and address those vulnerabilities uh, we've we've seen this at veracode and actually it's it's some of the good uh, information that it's available on the state of software security report but which by the way we just uh, made available just a week or a couple of weeks ago um, uh, which by the way we've been doing this for 10 years uh, and because veracode offers a SaaS solution we have information for um, from thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, applications um, so um, this is something that is mentioned there in the report but definitely the more often you scan, the more uh, vulnerabilities you address. If you wait longer, then you don't have time to go back and address all these different flaws or, or, or vulnerabilities. So uh, in the case of software composition analysis, the recommended step is right there when you're doing your continuous integration and automate that with your continuous integration pipelines, with, with your CI pipelines. Um, you know, this is just a, a quick example of uh, running and doing this from an API or from the command line and see the results um, right there, right? So in summary, um, for these four challenges that I, I've been discussing and how to address them, uh, for silent fixes, uh, important to have an up-to-date proprietary database with all the vulnerabilities, you know, be ahead of uh, a hub so, so, so you have all that information uh, uh, almost immediately or, or you know, basically the next day so so you can be up to date in terms of you know, what do I need to address in terms of vulnerabilities for my apps. If there's a new vulnerability tomorrow, if there's a new vulnerability today, I want to know, right? It's not like you just build the app and it's all good uh, because open source, it's out there, it's on the open. Uh, there are potentially new vulnerabilities that can that come come to play and might affect your, your app. So you have to keep up with that. It's important to have a, a very good uh, database with all these vulnerabilities. Uh, most important, not just where it's available on the national vulnerability database, but also with, with the ones that are discovered out there in, on the open right on, 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 on Git repos. Um, the risk of prioritization, you know, the recommended um, way to do this is not 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 just on based on the CVSS scores, but also based on the detection of vulnerable methods. Um, um, that will help you prioritize, saying giving you certainty that you, the your first party code is actually using the vulnerable method of the open source library. And with functionality like automatic pull request, you know that would also help you with the prioritization or or not only help with the position, but help you with the fix. Um, transitive vulnerabilities, you have to identify the dependencies, right? You, you definitely need to know um, if you are vulnerable down the road on, on the chain of all these dependent or transitive libraries. Uh, and finally, um, to keep up with the speed of DevOps uh, and make it dev, instead of DevOps, DevSecOps, right? That's, a, that's another buzzword, I guess. <laughs> um, to make it DevSecOps or include security in your in your automation, um, you know, scan with software composition analysis and do it on an automated way. Do it on your CI pipelines. So software composition analysis will give you this. Uh, will um, let you kind of shift more left or you know shift to the right. Maybe use two types of uh, options to do your scan via an agent, or maybe uploading and using uh, scanning on a platform. Um, um, be able to have a really good database with inf up-to-date information about open source vulnerabilities that includes the CVEs or non-CVEs or reserve CVEs and and, uh, and the information, specific information about where is the vulnerable method within each library. Um, of course, support for all the languages that, that you're using, right? Not, not everyone is just using Java or just using JavaScript. There, there's a variety of uh, preferences there. Uh, help you to prioritize those findings, help you get information of those dependencies, um, be able to define some rules or policies. Uh, alerting, I didn't mention alerting, but also that's a, a definitely a nice to have in terms of be able to notify you when there's a new, there's a change in something that, that you already have. Right, if there's a new vulnerability, if there's an update on a vulnerability. 
uh, and, and finally, uh, I mentioned briefly that the, the case for the license, um, open source licenses uh, are important, especially if you have commercial software out there, uh, they could have some legal implications. So good to know what are the, the open source libraries that the components that you are using uh, are, are there. So with that, um, I think we're gonna move to a, a Q and A session. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, we have about, that oh, looks about, at least about 15 minutes or so for questions. So if you have any, please go ahead and use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your question and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, let's start with, isn't open source more secure than commercial software? Um, I've been an advocate of open source. Uh, uh, I, um, I tend to say yes, it's more mm -hmm. secure than commercial software. Uh, why? Because especially for, now I'm going to kind of generalize right now, right? But the most popular open source uh, projects out there, uh, they've been enhanced and enhanced and fixed and, and, and by many, many different people. Um, so there are more eyes um, on the code that uh, generally means less bugs and less defects. Um, so that's a good thing. Now, um, there's nothing formal, right? So when you are developing code on your organization, you, you have a formal process that goes through uh, quality assurance or uh, quality engineering. And, and then you, you know, certain steps that that takes you to deliver to release your software and make your software generally available well we don't have those specific steps on open source right so it's more about you know uh contributions so it's an interesting question i i tend to say yes go for the latest innovation especially the the the, the popular libraries out there uh even if they are new defects found or vulnerabilities or bugs, uh, it's likely that you're gonna get the latest version, someone is gonna go and address that. So I tend to kind of recommend more, more of that and say that it's, it's more secure, but it obviously depends on the, depends on what you're, what you're using. Okay, great. Next question. Um, can you talk more about the use cases for the two types of SCA scan? Yeah, so I didn't talk much about that, but, um, um, Something that we offer at Veracode, um, I think it's very unique in the, in the industry, is uh, having the two options to, to do the SCA scan. Uh, there are products out there that use one or the other. Uh, we actually have uh, the two. Uh, one, it's an agent-based scan. So basically it's a very lightweight software, an agent that developers uh, download in locally, so in their MacBooks or in their laptops, uh, or wherever the CI pipeline it's hosted and, and that's where they run the scans. The results go, go, to, uh, go to, to a platform and, and you get the results there, but you can, you can run that locally. So it's, that's, that's agent-based. Um, the agent runs the scan at the time of, uh, basically it performs a build. It uses the package manager for the app to, to run this. The, as part of the build is the detection of the different libraries and then going and, and cross-checking if there are vulnerabilities on those libraries. The second method or the other method is um, based on, uh, you upload the, the application. Typically you, you upload your compile application for some languages, for, for others, it's just a packaged uh, uh, application. Typically you do that when you are done with the app or when you're ready to go to pre-production. And you upload that uh, in the case of Veracode to our platform where the, where the, the scan happens on the cloud. Right? So you send the software, the, the application somewhere else, and, and, and you get the, uh, and then it's a scan there. One of the big differences is you, you just have to upload the final app, right? The, the packaged app, uh, you are not sending the code. You are just sending either the, the compile app, maybe just the jars or the DLLs, uh, or you're just packaging you know, your JavaScript code, uh, your JavaScript li uh, libraries, um, so, so that's one of the, the differences. And then the different use cases, right? So typically um, more of the security side of uh, organization, they want to upload and scan and get the results, apply some policies. And, and then agent base is typically more on the developer side where the developers 
um, uh, are using the agent, they have access to the, the code, of course, they have access to the repos, which security professionals might not have access to, and then they scan directly there on the code. So a little bit of a different use cases, different personas that might use one or the other, but at the end of the day, um, you know, it's about comparing with a very good proprietary database of vulnerabilities. All right, great. Uh, just a quick reminder, if you have a question for Javier, please go ahead and use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit it. And we'll move on to the next question here. We release frequently and security testing would slow us down. How can we ensure that we don't release vulnerable code? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the challenges that, that I was talking about, right? The speed, right? And no one wants to, to, um, to slow down that, that, that process. Uh, first of all, I have to say that for SEA, um, it's very quick, right? This is this is not the same type of uh, of uh, analysis that it's done with other type of uh, products. So it's not like a, a static type of analysis or dynamic type of analysis. Here, it's about identifying the 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 open source libraries and then comparing with our proprietary database to see if you have vulnerabilities on on those on those libraries, right? So you know, describing this at a very high level, uh, it, it's relatively simple and the scans take seconds. Um, I haven't seen more than, uh, you know, maybe some very large apps might take a minute or two, but the scans here are, we're talking about seconds. Now, I was talking to a customer recently that said, yeah, I mean, it typically takes about 10 seconds to scan all these apps, uh, but still, you know, you add 10 seconds here, 10 seconds there, and, and, and then adds, adds, adds up a lot. So what we're doing is, you know, we're not, developers can scan whatever they want, uh, as many times as they want locally, but on the pipeline, we only scan the master branch. So, so that's a way to kind of, kind of re reduce increasing time on, on the pipelines. And again, SEA is, is really, really quick. It's, it's, it's a matter of seconds um, uh, that adds to, you know, that adds uh, the security component that is very, very important uh, to your organization. I forgot to mention also at the beginning, um, you know, when we talk about app security, and, and you know, we talk about this at Veracode across all, all the products a lot, is uh, it's the fact that, you know, at the end of the day, if there's a breach, if there's a breach, there's a brand, uh, that's a brand problem, right? It might not be commercial, it might not be financial, uh, but but the reputation and the brand gets affected. So you know, very 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 important as companies have hundreds or thousands of apps to to pay attention to to security. Right? Excellent. Okay. All right. Looks like we have one more question here. So there's plenty of time, guys. If you have a question for Javier, go ahead and uh, submit it via the Go to Webinar control panel. So the next question, I don't think my application uses the vulnerable part of an open source library. Am I still at risk? Yeah, that's, uh, that's important. That's, that's, uh, that's a good question. So um, yes, the answer is yes, you're still at <laughs> risk. Um, at this specific time, you, your application might not be using the vulnerable part of the library, right? So libraries might have the, the component, the software, the open source component might have different functionality, right? It might have, it might do two or three different things. The one thing that it's that it's vulnerable. If you are not using that, you say, well, you know, then then it's no risk. Um, yes, you're still at risk because you um, that library is already vulnerable. Likely that you they might find more vulnerabilities out there. That you don't know, and we've seen this time and time again, where you know a, a library with a vulnerability, all of a sudden we find two or three or more vulnerabilities. So the recommendation is, yes, please go ahead. Especially if most of the time you already have a fix with the version, go and update to a safe version or the safer version. Um, now, yes, you might want to say, well, I'm not using that vulnerable part. Maybe I want to. That's not my highest priority. I can do it later. Yes, you can deprioritize that, but the recommendation is definitely go ahead and, and address that, go to the safer version, uh, because you never know if you're gonna get another vulnerability, uh, you know, anytime. All right. 
Okay, we're about, uh, I would say about 10 minutes to the top of the hour. Um, plenty of time for a couple more questions, if uh, anybody has any. While we're waiting to see if any more come in, I do want to remind the audience that today's event is being recorded. So if you miss any or all of it, or if you just want to watch it again, you'll have the opportunity to do so. Uh, we'll be sending out an email after today's event that takes that contains a link to the, to watch the webinar on demand. And the webinar is also going to be living on the devops.com website. So you can always find it there. Just go to devops.com slash webinars, look in the on demand section and it should be right there waiting for you. Um, and while you're there, please check out the other webinars that we have both upcoming and on demand. Hopefully there'll be one or two there that pique your interest. Um, doesn't look like we're getting any more questions in. So I do wanna thank everybody who did submit questions. There were some really good ones in there. And uh, Javier, I want to thank you for giving such a great presentation. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Great. I also want to thank the audience for joining me today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I am signing off. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks. Bye.